What is up, everybody? It is Monday afternoon, 3.30 almost, and we just wrapped up our 10th training camp practice. You're watching Shout, a Buffalo Bills football podcast brought to you by Tops Friendly Market, your neighborhood store with more. And no, this is not Ryan Talbot here <laughs> today. Uh, late edition, uh, Ryan uh, pinch hit for me all uh, weekend on the Josh Allen extension news. So uh, I went to the bullpen, brought in my buddy John Scott from Spectrum Sports. How are you, my friend? Good. A, a little more hair than Ryan. Little. Only a little. <laughs> Listen, I I give you credit because you, you, you're you right. You, you're dealing with some hair <laughs> issues, but it, you pull it off. And listen, you see this guy in the gym. Uh, it, he puts a lot of us to shame. So, you know, I, I might have some nice hair here, but elite you should hair. see him on the elite you should hair. see him on the bench press. That's an elite <laughs> situation. All right, Tops loves local. Tops is proud to partner with over 200 local growers to supply Tops with their freshest homegrown fruits and vegetables. Produce pick this morning can be on your table tonight. Thank you to Tops, our uh, awesome sponsor. We got a lot to talk about today. Um, if you're not following John on Twitter. What are you doing, Bills fans? John Scott TV at John Scott TV, J O N S C O T T TV. After practice every day, he's got you covered with the video from practice. Practice whatever happened that you want to see that we're allowed to 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 take video of. Um, let me start with your impression of practice today. It was a little. You could tell that the process is starting for getting ready for the preseason game. A lot of install today. A lot of walkthrough. A lot of. Um, uh, fervor from the coaching staff. Uh, we can't really get too much into that, but what was your main takeaway from today? The offense was humming and the defense was not, especially one of the most fun things to watch, I guess, for lack of a better term is DBs versus wide receivers. It's a, it's a part from a video standpoint in previous years, it was the best content that I would gain. Of course, that it helped elevate the lore of Duke Williams. Many times Gabriel Davis <laughs> really shined early in training camp last season when he was a rookie because of the footage that we were able to get, not able to film it at this point. The team does and usually puts it out, but uh, I was really interested to look at it today and the DBs were getting smoked. Oh my goodness. The only time where I would say the DBs won was a fantastic play by Cam Lewis. He actually ripped mm -hmm. the ball out of the hands of Isaiah McKenzie for an interception beyond that, everyone up and down the depth chart, whether it was Tredavious White or someone you may feel is just a camp body, they all were struggling to win their one-on-one -on -one battles. That is what stood out to me the most, um, and it was hot. And we saw some guys mm -hmm. dealing with that. I asked Harrison Phillips about it afterwards. He said, listen, we need to learn how to play in this, noting that they play in Miami in South Florida early in the season as well. But it was hot. Tempers were hot, at least on the coaching side of things at points. Um, and – as you said, we're really trending towards game, towards a game here where, where I think that's where the evaluations are really going to take a step up. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten bored of talking about this offense at this point. And Josh Allen, I've written about him every day. We've talked about him so much over the last couple of days, and rightfully so. I mean, I mean, fans want to know how Josh Allen is looking going into this thing. But I, I've kind of come to – this baseline that we're going to see to your point that they are just humming Cole Beasley. He was in there today. No Stefan Diggs, who I will say I was impressed. I mean, people have talked about what he's meant to this team um, from a leadership standpoint. You see it in so many ways today out there during reps when he probably could have been inside on a hot day. He was out there during the early portion of practice, working with Marquez Stevenson, Lance Lenore, some of the younger receivers coaching them up during that. I think a couple of people put video out of it. And uh, it, that was cool to see because, you know, he had such, this stigma about him. He's been anything but that since getting here. And I think you've seen that predating Stefan with other guys here and Sean McDermott. He even said it on Friday when discussing Josh Allen's extension. Their goal is to bring people here and they become the best versions of themselves. And Stefan Diggs, I think, is certainly a poster child. We understand that the narrative can get shifted when things go sour just in general. So maybe it was a little bit exaggerated, some of the disconnect between him and the hard feelings here, but he's been a tremendous teammate. People say it, we then see it, and he's been an elite wide receiver, at least on the field through one year. You're right. He really stood out there, and I agree with Josh, where, all right, 
Like this is what it is. Mm -hmm. And the Bills clearly think that by paying him that much money, this is what it is. No long, it's no longer a story when Josh is good or even frankly when Josh is great. It's more of a story of who is the greatness being distributed to mm -hmm. and how consistent is it? But uh, you're right. The bar is not here. It is not here. It is, it is out of the screen here with Josh. And it really now, in my opinion, is only a story when it's back here, which we have seen occasionally, infrequently, but we have seen a bit here in camp. So if you're watching this on Syracuse.com or NewYorkUpstate.com, one of the coolest features of the observation stories, when we do it like this and it lines up like this, is I press publish on my story uh, about three or four minutes before we let, went live. So everybody that's going on there, they'll see a video at the top and they can hit play so they can read the story and watch us live. It's such a cool experience. So if you're watching on there, thank you. Everybody on YouTube, hit that like button. We got a bunch of people in here. Make sure you hit that subscribe button as well if you're new here. I want to shift gears to the defensive line because I, it was a weird practice today. It was really slow at the beginning. They did a lot of work where they were having some of the linemen kneel down and work on one side of the play. Like a, a lot of like um, slower motion. They went up tempo at the end of practice a little bit, and we can get into that. But two defensive linemen in particular – stood out to me today. And the first one is an important one. And one I, I was watching today specifically because every time we do this uh, post-practice show, I get all the comments here. And the one that continues to come in is how Star Latula they working, looking. So I let off with that because we asked Justin Zimmer about him today. We asked Harrison Phillips about him today. There was one rep in particular. It was perfect timing. I was standing off to the side. He, he ate a double team right off the bat. First came in, in contact with Cody Ford, blasted through him. I mean, Cody Ford had trouble keeping his hands on him. He was so explosive off the line, passed him off to Ryan Bates. And in that moment, Ryan Bates had no answer. Luckily for Ryan Bates, who I also wrote about and had a nice day. I'll get to him in a minute. Josh Allen has been so good about feeling pressure and getting rid of the ball. The ball was out before Star got there. But it was such a phenomenal rep from Star Latule. He looks like he's getting into – um, regular season mode, which is a good thing because we didn't know how long that would take considering he only showed up for minicamp. It's like we're reintroducing ourselves to star because he was widely criticized the season before he opted out mm -hmm. and people were saying he's not living up to the contract. Then you saw what his absence meant in regards to he does the dirty work. He really is the cog up there that makes everything else go. Then he shows up for mini camp finally, and you look at him, and this is why I asked him back then, are you small? I mean, he did not look big <laughs> right. for a guy that all we ever know him for is taking up double teams and being a space eater. I, I, I honestly forgot he's actually not this 330-pound behemoth that mm -hmm. just stands there and clogs up because he's so big. Now you're getting reintroduced to Star that he's not this oversized defensive tackle that's almost what makes him so great. But mm -hmm. his ability to hold those double teams is is critical. And now that he's getting back into the mix of things, the pads have been on now uh, for a few practices. That is knocking off some of his rust. You're right. I, I, now you're going to see Star be Star. Mm -hmm. And I think now, like a lot of things over the past year and a half plus, we're really going to appreciate what he brings to this defense, understanding what life was like without him. Um, good question here from Josh McCartney. It is a Starbucks cold brew. Uh, I am drinking to get me through, uh, this hot day. Uh, I had to double up on the, uh, on the coffee. We were actually having a pre-workout discussion this morning. Uh, cause I've been getting after it, lost some weight. You know, the COVID, uh, weight is, is coming off this summer and it's good to have days like this. Cause you sweat some of it off. Uh, but I, what do you think about this? I had, I had some pre-workout this morning. Then I had my morning coffee. Now I'm hitting a cold brew in the afternoon. It's a lot of caffeine. I'm not a caffeine guy. The only caffeine I consume is in my pre-workout. That's probably why why it hits. Not a coffee guy. I worked an overnight shift in news as a photographer for a morning show for over a year and a half. I figured if I'm not going to pick up coffee working from midnight to 9 a.m., I don't need to pick it up ever. Um, I did have a cup of coffee at my wedding because I needed to pick me up. Those who've been married, you know, it's a long day. Uh, so I needed to pick me up. Uh, but that is a lot of caffeine, though you are – far from uh, abnormal in that type of consumption and not even remotely close to Dan Campbell. So okay. uh, there, there <laughs> you go. That's true. You're that's, good. true. That's, that's very true. Um, I'm surprised you fit in a cup of coffee on your wedding day, but that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> for another day. Um, let's go back to this. Uh, let's, let's switch 
lines. I want to talk about another defensive lineman, but while we're there, and I was mentioning Ryan Bates, there, there, you know, Matthew Harmon, who's really active in the in the comments, he he was making the argument for Justin Zimmer over Harrison Phillips months ago. And it's it's a it's a conversation that we've got into quite a bit. Well, I will give you a note on on Justin Zimmer. While I've, I think he's had a fine camp so far, it's hard to tell. We'll see in the preseason. He struggled today against Ryan Bates. There was two specific reps where I thought that Ryan Bates won outright. I mean, he just completely stifled him. Um, it, and that's a big deal for Ryan Bates, who, depending on the day, depending on where they have him situated, he's had a lot of opportunities this training camp. And I kind of want to pick your brain on how you think this this offensive line um, competition shakes out. After you get past that first five, I, I think we've all kind of gone in with the idea that it's Dawkins, Feliciano, Morse, Ford, and Williams. And then after that, it gets really interesting. I think there's questions at swing tackle, depending on how good you feel about Spencer Brown. But uh, you're looking at the rest of this line, including a guy like Forrest Lamp that they brought in and some other pieces that they have like Ike Bucker. I think Ryan Bates, to me, is number six after those five. Weigh in. It's interesting. I'd probably put Ike Bucker as number six. Mm -hmm. um, a guy who started a lot of games last season. I was actually, I think he started 12 games, which mm -hmm. also shows the interchangeable things with injuries they dealt with last year on that offensive line. That was a wide topic. The continuity question was wide throughout last season. I'd put him in there. Bates is another guy that's been in the system. They like that. I know the performance of Tommy Doyle hasn't been great, mm -hmm. but he's a draft pick. And the one thing that I, that I always go back to when, when I try to put the roster together, the initial 53 is they value draft picks mm -hmm. so, so much. And even if he's not showing it now, I think it's worth it for them, especially if a fifth round pick that I don't just foresee him being cut, even if he's not necessarily going to be much of a contributor mm -hmm. here. I think that that's, another former fifth round pick that they liked, they kept around and ultimately didn't have a space for was Wyatt Teller. They kept him around for a mm -hmm. bit, mm -hmm. um, even though he really didn't have a role until later in his rookie year. So I, I think Tommy Doyle is in the mix there as well. The question I think is ultimately going to be, do they keep nine or 10? Mm -hmm. and, and that's going to ultimately kind of make things see how they all sift out. Because again, you go with the five, you keep the two rookies, you're already at seven, Bucker, and Bates, that's nine right there. Then right. what happens with Forrest Lamp? Do they have someone who can play center? Uh, I believe we've seen uh, at one of these practices on a Saturday, Jamil Douglas has gotten run at center here. Um, so is that a guy whose versatility could land him in this group as well? So uh, I'm not as I'm not going to put Bates at six, but I I think that he's a guy that has a proven track record with this team, and I think he definitely is in the mix to to be one of the O linemen. Mm -hmm. I think he's I think Bucker and Bates are locks. I think that they both have had have proven the ability to come in and play meaningful snaps in a regular season NFL game. I think Forrest Lamp, you're seeing what the problem has been for him his whole career, and what we're seeing already. I mean, he was walking around today. He had like these little um, the tape. Yeah, he had like a machine hooked up to his oh, yeah. um, calf. His to his calf. He was walking around. He had. I'd be interested to find out what it was, but it was probably reading like some, some of those. They they send waves. It's almost oh, like it's massaging the calf. Yeah. Okay. And and that's you know sometimes you see it on shoulders or other parts where it it stimulates the muscles with with mm -hmm. some some vibes like that. And that might have been what it is. It's almost like getting a massage of, of sorts without laying down and, and getting, getting gotcha. a massage. I think that that is what that was. Interesting. And, you know, so he's been unavailable. He was, he had a pretty considerable limp. Then you throw into the mix, just the Deion Dawkins situation in general. We were talking about this the other day, the COVID part of this whole thing, you know, it seemed like Ike Bucker got back sooner than Deion Dawkins. We don't know when both of the guys contracted it and all the details of that. But when a guy gets back, not only have they missed that chunk of time of training, but we've seen in the NFL guys that have got some guys that have gotten it impacted by it. And and you got to get back in your guy, your conditioning up. And then we're talking about, you know, a guy like Deion Dawkins, who probably didn't play, uh, you know, a ton uh, in OTAs and, and minicamp. He's going to have to get in the game shape here. And so the one good thing that I think that that is provided now, Lamp not being it 
being available is it's provided guys that maybe wouldn't have gotten the kind of meaningful reps and snaps that they've gotten. Guys like Spencer Brown, Tommy Doyle, Jack Anderson, even obviously, you know, you even look at Saturday, he was playing mostly on the third team. Um, some struggles for him uh, at times today as well. I, but you're going to have that, but I think you need to kind of get thrown into the fire. Uh, like I believe it was Mitch Moore said earlier uh, in, in sink or swim. The Dawkins thing is interesting because camp, you said 10 practices. It started the last week of July. We're approaching, I believe, what, Wednesday will be two full weeks mm-hmm. in, and Dion hasn't been on there. Um, so just imagine two weeks without working out, presumably, or right. doing light workouts. So from a strength standpoint, that matters. From a conditioning standpoint, that matters. And when people get sick, again, we don't know details. Did he lose weight? I mean, so, and even if you work out, sometimes you lose weight or you distribute it mm-hmm. poorly or whatnot. So it, it's, it shouldn't be a foregone conclusion that, you know, if we see Dion back on the practice field sometime either this week or after the preseason game, he's still going to be behind. And how long does it take him to get his body where it needs to be to be Dion Dawkins, your franchise left tackle? It's It may not just be how long does it take Dion to get back on the field? How long does it take him to be the player that, that he needs to be? It will be nice in some sense that there's only three preseason games, but the the gap is still the same. So there'll be a couple of times where he's not on the field, where uh, where they're not playing games before the regular season to where maybe he can use that time to beef up. So that I think is interesting because as you said, if not, it appears Spencer Brown may be that guy that's going to have to fill in. And those are lofty shoes to fill for a rookie like that to maybe have to have an extended role here early in the season. Mm-hmm. We're going to get into a couple more things. I also see some uh, questions in here. I see the CJ uh, Henderson question, which I think we can we can talk about. I want to talk about that anyway, because every time that there's any type of news on a, on a player, it's like social media just jumps into the <laughs> comments and like, trade for him, get him. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, we're so thankful the Tops spend more time enjoying everything that summer has to offer and less time worrying about getting to the store with Tops pickup and delivery. Shop for, for your groceries online. Choose pickup or delivery. Tops will bring the groceries right to you. Visit topsmarkets.com to get started. And you know who you know showed up to camp and just got started was Epi Obata. I've, I've, you got to be careful. I feel like you get into training camp. We got the Jake Kumaro story that we're following. And now Epi Obata, a guy that had some success last year, but we're not talking about any type of you know, consistent year to year production here. This is a guy that just learned how to play football a couple of years ago, but man, Effie Obata from his press conference today, I want to get into that. He had two more sacks today that, that, that I saw. One of them was maybe close, but I thought I heard a whistle on both uh, beat a, uh, uh, you know, one of the lower tier offensive linemen on, on one of the play, but the second play was, you know, just absolutely, um, just showing the quickness. I know a lot of people talked about what he did on the inside last year, but I've been equally impressed with the work that he's done on the outside. He's, he's so powerful, but he's also so quick. And he talked about combining those kinds of things on the outside. It's easier to rush on the inside because, you know, he goes up against guards that just don't have the quicks to stay with him or deal with his power from that position. But on the outside, you really got to time things. Like it seems like his timing has been great. Even when he's rushing on the outside, he's a monster. And that was what a lot of people noted. I put up a couple of the sound bites from his very entertaining and insightful press conference. And they're like, holy trap. I mean, <laughs> he, the dude is, is thick and it makes you think, well, I understand you were in another country. Why weren't you playing some sort of a physical sport your entire life here? And yes, now he says he's, he's at the point understanding the game where he's not thinking and he's mm-hmm. reacting. And that's allowing his physical gifts to flow freely here But that size has allowed him to be such a force inside and out. He had five and a half sacks, 15 quarterback hits last season with the Panthers. That would have led this team Mm -hmm. over Jerry Hughes and the likes of Mario Addison, A.J. Klein, things like that. There's definitely a role in here. And I think he's he has shown some flashes here. And we know it's a heavy rotation here. He mentioned his production and getting up to speed at this point early in his football career is about reps. And last season with Carolina, he got more reps Mm -hmm. than he'd ever gotten. And I think it's also a very good situation for him reuniting with Eric Washington, who he gave a lot of credit to 
not really treating him like a guy who would never play football. Right. He treated him like the Mario Addisons and other players of a higher caliber in Carolina. Now they reunite. That's really comforting for him. He's part of that heavy rotation that the Bills love to do. And, yeah, I think he's been impactful. And, again, what makes this defensive line so intriguing as a whole is the versatility. And, and he, like a guy like Greg Rousseau and Boogie Basham, really exemplify that. Um, I know somebody early on in the comments said, oh, I'm kind of bummed to read Matt's story and not see – maybe a bit – actually, somebody maybe tweeted at me. I, I haven't seen Rousseau or Basham as much the last couple of days. I wrote a lot about them early in camp. Uh, they, they're both still making some some plays here and there. Like today, Rousseau came in on a, on a really nice pass rush, and it looked like a scene out of um, Space Jam. <laughs> like when, when Michael Jordan jumped up to do the dunk <laughs> at the end, Gregory Rousseau went – Straight up in the air, and Josh Allen, being Josh Allen, just gave him like a very little pump fake, and then moved right around him because he would he was way up in the air. But seeing a guy six eight jump like that was absolutely unbelievable. Basham had a nice play against the run on Saturday, and today he won uh, a nice rep as well. I had it written down in my notes. You know, I think they've been fine. I think it's just right now getting to that next stage and getting to the game situation. And Effie Obata talked about it today. He's like. At times, it's kind of weird. You're walking around. You're getting to know your teammates. We're doing a lot of team bonding, and you see guys in the hall. And maybe you maybe you don't want, you you don't want to be as physical with them as you need to be. It's going to be nice to get into a game environment where I have no qualms about going in there and mixing it up with some of these guys. And Rousseau hasn't played in the game since 2019. Right. I mean, he took it all off, and, and he may downplay it the fact that he's finally back in pads and things like that. But let's be real. That I mean, if you haven't played a game, Star Lutule is going to be the same way. If you haven't been in the full go of a game going up against an opponent where to Obata's point, you're not holding back there. Right. You may hold back ever so slightly to not hurt or do anything that, that negatively could impact the team in practice. You get to that game on Friday night in Detroit. That's where it's going to be interesting again. Also because yes, they may look at film. I don't know how much you actually do that in preseason, so it's maybe more of a blank slate where he can try out some things where going up against Daryl Williams or other tackles, they've been doing that for a while now. So maybe he mentioned Rousseau in particular, how your stance and certain things can give a tell to a lineman. Well, if you've done it enough against guys on your own team, it's definitely a tell. Maybe we'll see against Detroit if some of these younger guys can make an impact going up against other guys. Let's get into this C.J. Henderson conversation. There's more from practice that we can get into before we get out of here. I see the numbers trending upwards. We're almost to 300 on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you slam that um, – or what's the, what do the cool kids say? Smash that like button. At, you know, I'm not cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not cool. If you've got a social media question, this is not the place to go. Uh, Mr. John Scott uh, is good at a lot of things, but social media, <laughs> not one of them. All right, so – C.J. Henderson, apparent, reportedly, according to Jeremy Fowler from ESPN, the Jaguars are interested in potentially having conversations about moving him. This is a former first-round pick, a guy that, you know, you go back to that draft period. I mean, I, I believe, was that the last? Was he drafted last year or 19? He was 19, I believe. So we were – that was the combine. We were there, and he was a guy that – you know, I think the we're always talking about cornerback with the Bills. I mean, Levi Wallace, every year we're talking about what can the Bills do to bring in a guy that can supplant him as starter. A couple things on Henderson, though, that I think is interesting. You go back to his college tape uh, or his college scouting reports, and one of the things I tweeted it the other night, you know, some issues closing in as a tackler, which I think is going to be big-time demerits for, the, for this coaching staff in Buffalo. Number two, sometimes struggle to, fi to find his man in zone. Uh, coverage, which I think is another issue. We've heard from Levi Wallace and Dane Jackson talk about the unbelievable process it's been. Guys that were really good, like good at press in college, trying to come into this defense and learn how to be an off corner in a zone scheme. Tredavious White has spent his career perfecting it, and even he still at times, you know, it has some learning moments. And so I think bringing in a guy that maybe. At this stage of the game, especially, like, listen, if a deal is there and, and it makes sense and, and it's it's not going to cost you a lot, sure, go out and acquire a guy and you'll you'll develop him, whatever. You still have Levi Wallace and, and Dane Jackson. But I'm not – I don't think we're sitting here talking about Brandon being given up a, a day one pick for a guy that, you know, unless it's a, a perfect fit schematically and what they're looking for in a player at that position. 
And I believe the report said there's no real angst between the, the two sides. Mm-hmm. They just maybe feel more comfortable with the new coaching staff, with the other options that they have. I still would be taken back that a high first round pick, regardless of a regime change, potentially on the outs just a couple of years later. I, w- I wish I wish I would. I definitely profiled him leading into that draft. But since it was so long ago, I can't remember everything. <laughs> but I, I mean, I did like him. I physically gifted at Florida. And but again, I, I think to your point, is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, is he that big of an upgrade for the price that you'd have to pay over what you have in Levi Wallace or what you have in Dane Jackson? And I would say immediate upgrade because this team is in the now. Right. This is the now. You don't have time for a young player who maybe isn't as well versed in zone coverage to come in here and take a year or even half a year to figure it out and improve. They have guys that are already in the system for a year plus in Dane Jackson's case, Levi multiple years as the starter that if they're going to bring in somebody else, they want to know what they're getting. If they're going to pay that sort of a premium, I'm pretty sure they probably, there were some good cornerbacks in the draft this year that if they had fallen to them, maybe that's the pick instead of Rousseau, Mm -hmm. Although it, it appears they really felt defensive line is where they needed to address some things. But I don't think – what's the price for a guy who was a first-round pick only a couple of years ago? I, yeah, I agree with you. It's probably, a, I mean, a second or a third. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that that's necessarily worth it because then you also are going to have to get rid of another corner. And right. Does that mean not saying Cam Lewis is not expendable, but he's been in the system. They right. like what they've seen from him. And how many corners are they going to keep as it is? I just don't see it as a fit right now unless the price is is incredibly cheap. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to practice before we get out of here. Uh, Yes, answering some questions uh, in the comments. We are in the stadium. Uh, We're working out of the press box, which is where we'll be all year long after games. Uh, This room right here usually uh, is probably going to be the place to be. Practice happened at the Ad Pro Sports training facility uh, about a football field away here. We come and, and the media works here in the press box. You know, it might be some recency bias now looking back at my Ryan Bates comments. Um, Ike Bucker had a tough day today. Um, I thought that both of those losses that we mentioned uh, or, or um, that I mentioned about Ob- was, for Obata was against Bucker. And I think that I don't know what your impressions have been about him since he's returned from the COVID reserve list. You wonder how uh, we haven't had a chance to talk to him, how much that process um, getting back into game uh, game shape, uh, how that process is going. But I felt like, you know, pretty consistently um, he struggled since coming back. And he's been back a couple less, couple less than a week. Yes. Couple so uh, let's also keep that into mind here that very few guys, especially, I mean, let's, let's understand his pecking order here. They're, they may not come in and be world beaters, especially against a defensive line that has a lot of depth and guys that have been revving and roaring here for some time. I think it's a stretch maybe to say Ike Bucker is one of your five best offensive linemen. I think he's fine as a fill-in guy that can play multiple spots up front. And I think if this line is at the level that the Bills hope and need it to be, Ike Bucker is not in the conversation to be a starter. I mean, he's been getting some run on these Saturday practices, at, you know, at different spots and whatnot. I think that that's fine. I mean, that's the role he's that I think he is best suited for. So if I if you see him struggle against an FA Obata or a Greg Rousseau or you know, some of these, some of these guys, I'm not as concerned understanding that we've seen a good body of work in game action when he is you know, fully in into his conditioning and, and in the mix here. And, and that's what I would tend to put more weight on at this point. Now we get a preseason game or two under our belts and he's, he's back off that COVID list a week, week and a half in. I think then it's reasonable to not fully just rely on what you saw in 12 games a year ago. But I think at this point, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that, that maybe – you know, similar to what maybe we'll see out of Dion if, if and when he comes back, it'll be all right. They they, they got to get back back to it. And under we don't know again to your point because we haven't talked to him what he actually had to deal with in regards to working out and things like that. Maybe he's still not at a hundred percent to where he'd want to be at this point in camp. 
Let's get to the injury report before we get out of here because it was a pretty lengthy one. I'm going to bring it up here because I can't remember it all uh, off the top all right. of my head. Um, but I think first and foremost, I do want to talk about Jerry Hughes, who we've seen now two straight practices, Saturday and then today, doing some considerable work off of the side. It looks like he's really starting to test that calf, still remains on the non-football uh, injury list. Uh, but we saw last year, like Cole Beasley kind of ramping up off of that when he came back. Um, or maybe it was that was was that two years ago when he first got here when he was dealing with correct some uh, he was just cleaning up some stuff. Uh, so Jerry Hughes looks good. I think that's a good update. Here's the following players that missed practice today. We mentioned Diggs with a knee injury. We'll be monitoring that. Somebody asked me how serious they think it is, and I just said it's serious enough that he wasn't dressed today. But at the same time, remember what time of year it is. And we'll see how long it goes on. Matt Milano started out at practice. Then it's, I, I guess he less left. They list him with a mouth injury. Uh, John Feliciano, Tom, Do Tommy Doyle, non COVID illness. Uh, Mitch Morse got a rest day. Vernon Butler listed as a concussion. So he's in the protocol. Now Forrest lamp again with the calf Christian way with a shoulder, depending on how long Vernon Butler is out. Where do you kind of fall on Butler? Because I saw somebody in the co in the comments section, and if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. A lot of activity in the comments today, as usual. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button as well. I, I think that there are a couple scenarios with how much they like Justin Zimmer that you get to cut down day and you can talk yourself into why it might make sense. To, even with how much I think Eric Washington believes in Vernon Butler – to move on from him and save, I think it's like $2 million this year, and just go with uh, Phillips and Zimmer as your backup defensive tackles. He did rework that deal mm -hmm. in the offseason, and that's where I stand saying they reworked it, and I think it probably was a decision between him or Quentin Jefferson. They couldn't keep both. They were going to keep one or the other. Butler's the one that they decided to do it. I don't know, obviously, all the exact language, and you're right, there is some savings, but I tend to think if a guy, and I, I lump Addison in this because he did the same thing, I think that gives them a little bit of an advantage here mm -hmm. that they're not as touchable as maybe it is come cut day here. But if he's not available and Harrison Phillips and Justin Zimmer shine with these opportunities, that does matter. Butler's a bigger body, though, and last year they talked about being one of, if not the smallest, defensive fronts in the entire league. Butler provides some extra size on the interior there. Zimmer, you know, is someone that, that's a good story, but and they really do like him, but, you know, is, he, is it enough to, to go over someone like, like Vernon Butler, especially if they believe they could get Zimmer on the practice squad, and then if a couple games in, they obviously don't have a problem sitting a high paid defensive lineman. They did it with Trent Murphy right. all day or ever, uh, all, all of last season or the majority of last season. So I, I say that this is going to be interesting how long that he is out because with a lot of these injuries, I think because of who the player is and also the depth that they have, there's no rush to bring back a Jerry Hughes. You know about Jerry Hughes. But his absence has allowed more playing time for Gregory Rousseau, more playing time for Boogie Basham, more playing time for F.A. Obata. It's almost a benefit for that, that, that they're not out there. And if Vernon Butler's not, not out there, it, he's a little more vulnerable to not making the team than a Jerry Hughes. But, yeah, I, I think that this is the opportunity now for a guy like Justin Zimmer and Harrison Phillips to show in-game action that, that they deserve a spot. It's going to be interesting to see the thing about Vernon Butler that I keep coming back to. I don't know if Sean McDermott was thrilled with him not showing up for OTAs. And I think that for some guys, you kind of eat that a little bit. Like it's voluntary. A guy like Jerry Hughes is, has done enough in this league to where I think if you're Sean McDermott, you sit back and say, okay, you know, Mario uh, Addison, Mario Addison, Addison as well, for sure. But Vernon Butler sits a little bit different coming off of a year where he was kind of a disappointment and they build that as, you know, I know Eric Washington kept telling Leslie Frazier last year, be patient with this guy. He's going to come in. He's going to mean a lot for our defense and he still could. Maybe they do have a, maybe they envision him playing against playing next to star and maybe, you know, uh, 
that in a similar role to like he was in Carolina with star years ago when he played next to him in the three tech role and then subbed in behind him in a one tech role, kind of a hybrid position. Maybe they can do that again, but I think it might be cheaper long and, and to go with Zimmer and, and Harrison Phillips, and you might be getting more bang for your buck. We'll see. A lot to kind of. But what do they need the savings for? They Outside don't need the of Terry and Kim just paid a boatload for Josh Allen. Yeah, and you never know what else is coming. You know what I mean? And listen, I know that they have they've opened up about what, what are they seven or eight? Like, yeah, like what are they seven or eight million in cap space okay. right now? You know, opening up another two if it means going out and and making a trade. I think Brandon Bean likes that kind of you know versatility and 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 just in case he gets a, an offer that blows him away. But I'm still interested to see. With the numbers that they have, if we don't see some movement closer to cut down day, guys that maybe are on the roster bubble, you know, guys like Jake Kumaro come to mind. Um, I know that they like what he's like doing. And honestly, I have no problem projecting him to make the roster. I could see it happening and them trying to stash Isaiah Hodgins. It makes a lot of sense. But, you know, little by little, I, I do think Isaiah Hodgins is building some confidence with the way that he's playing as well. It's not as in your face as Kumaro, but he's been dependable. No big time drops. You saw the, the one-on-one rep today where I wrote about it. The, the explosion that he has at the line of scrimmage, similar in a lot of ways to what we saw in camp last year. A lot of similarities to what we see out of Gabriel Davis. I think the biggest problem for Hodgins is his game really is very similar to Gabriel Davis's in a lot of ways. And it, it replicates the skill set. but I still think that it's a nice problem to have to have this many guys. And I think, when it comes down to it, they drafted Isaiah Hodges. They didn't draft Jay Kumaro. And, hey, if you call the Green Bay Packers and they're willing to give you a third for Kumaro, I, I think you jump at that. I think a third would be wildly ambitious. And but you obviously yeah. <laughs> would jump at it. I, I think I agree. And Bean has shown just in general this is what he does. If he has a plush amount of players at one position, why a teller? I know some people will look in hindsight and say, well, that guy had a – Great year with the Browns. We should have kept him, but there was no room for him, and he didn't earn the spot. He had the opportunity at that point, so there also may be the opportunity here where some of these guys, whether it's the defensive line, whether it's the wide receiver room, whether it's maybe even offensive line, where they say we can get a fifth mm -hmm. for, for one of these guys. And as Brandon Bean alluded to on Friday after the Josh Allen extension, the pressure is even more so on them to get cheap young players and develop them because now that you, maybe not this year, maybe not even next year, but down the line, you have that huge cap hit for Josh Allen that you're going to have to rely more so on those types of guys. So there's nothing to scoff at a fifth round pick. Mm -hmm. The fifth round pick comes in next year. Maybe it's just a developmental year. And then when the cap number goes up, you maybe have to make some tough decisions. That guy who's been in the system a year or two as a fifth, a lower round pick, making pennies compared to other guys, they're going to have to be critical pieces here. So I could all but guarantee at least one deal is made with this extra depth. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was multiple. Yep. A lot more to work with this year for Brandon Bean with these preseason games to get people all types of uh, excited about some of the players here. John Scott coming in and uh, absolutely killing it on the pod here today for Ryan Talbot, who's celebrating his son's Owen's birthday. Uh, big number nine. Shout out to my guy, Owen. Hope you have a fun day. Um, and this podcast, as always, was brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets. Uh, Tops Fresh Burger Bar with over 30 varieties of beef, turkey, chicken, plant-based, and gourmet blend burgers ready to grill. Tops Fresh Burger Bar has you smiling all summer long. I still don't have it memorized. One of these days that I will. <laughs> Everybody gives me a uh, uh, problem for that uh, in the chat. I appreciate you guys. Hit that like button. Subscribe so you always get the notifications when we go live. We will be back tomorrow for another episode. Ryan will return. Thank you to John Scott. Have a great night, everyone. Take care.